Obviously, you guys know who I am, right? Um, Josh Osborne here, and I'm fucking pumped for this interview. For you guys know, for like the last five years, you know, I've been helping business owners kind of build online, right? But one thing that comes up again and again is that people, you know, they want a business, but they don't have the time or they don't have the money to get started, or maybe they've built a business and they scaled it to three to ten thousand a month, but they can't figure out how to make that jump from running it as a side hustle on top of their day job to being full time entrepreneurs. Now, for those of you that don't know Abe. He's an absolute beast, okay? He's a retired MMA fighter. He stood toe-to-toe -to -toe in the MMA cage with top fighters like Travis Brown and former heavyweight champion of the world, Tim Sylvia. Actually, he beat Tim Sylvia in 32 seconds, which launched him into the top 25 heavyweight rankings in the world. He knocked him out. But unlike a lot of other fighters, right, he did this as a part-time fighter on the side while building his professional career. By the age of 26, he was an executive, the director of finance and operations at a $300 million a year industrial distribution company that worked with huge companies like Hershey's, Con 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 I always Conagra. Fuck, I, Conagra, I always fucking butcher this, and Tyson, right? And as an entrepreneur, he's invented the first Brazilian jiu-jitsu training dummy to get in the UFC's uh, official uh, proof of uh, seal, right? So UFC is now selling his dummy. He's got a, he's got a contract with that. Um, he built this prototype in his basement and less than two years later, guys, he went from literally like duct tape and PVC pipe from his basement to a licensing deal with the biggest name in MMA. In the last year and a half, he's also started two other businesses. He started a construction company that did a half million dollars in its first year and a supplement distribution company that did a million in the first six months. And on top of that, the UFC deal would have just retired him enough, right? It would have been enough for you. Um, but he did all of this, right? So I know a little bit about Abe's background. I want you guys to know a little bit about Abe's background as well. I know he came from kind of living in motels as a child with two drug addict parents to where he is today. So what type of mindset, what type of like, what did you have to go through? What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned in life, Abe, to really get you to where you are today? I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, I get asked this question a lot. I think, you know, even early on, I think age six, age seven, I always knew like one, I wanted something more. And I knew that, um, no matter what, like the way I think about it, my will would never be broken, right? Like, like you knock me down 12 times, I'm standing up the 13th time. And if it's 112 times, I'll stand up 113th time, right? Like, I'm just, like, no matter what, you're never going to take that away from me. And I mean, that was like, you know, abusive parents, like that, my dad's like, want me to hit you here, here, or here, the face, because fuck you. How about that? <laughs> and so, um, or like, I could show you an article where like in college, I had a personal foul, I played football in college. A personal foul, so the coach was conditioning me after, like running me for punishment. He's like, "All right, you had enough." And so then I ran one more because, again, fuck you, you didn't take anything from me. So, like, you know, I think the biggest thing, and maybe the thing that's defined me, is just like, like, just the mindset that, like, no matter what happens, I'm gonna push through, right? Like, I mean, I'm not gonna, like, I'm gonna find a door if there's a door, but I'm not afraid to go through that wall, also, you know? Right. And so, tell us a little bit about your background. I know, I know it, but they don't know it. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, kind of what you went through, how you got to where you are today. Because right now you're in a really successful spot right. in your life. And I'm sure it wasn't always like that. I'm sure there's ups and downs, just like any of us, right? There's yeah, ups and downs sure. in life. So tell us a little bit about your ups and downs and what you had to go through. Well, I mean, I always say, like, you know, um, like I, I wrote a book recently, but one of the things I would say is, you know, the kindest thing I could say about my childhood is that I survived it. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, my parents, not not super great. Um you know, fairly abusive you know i could get into a bunch of like horror stories and stuff but you know suffice to say about every like three or four months i'd end up in foster care for about a month because my dad kicked my ass too much and for whatever reason they kept giving me back so it's kind of like just you know the ebb and flow of my life as a child you know um and then um you know in really poor neighborhoods like they would trade our food stamps for drugs or before i go out and play in the yard my mom would have to like check the, the like yard for used diaper and needles from the junkies overnight and stuff like that you know I had like one pair of pants, so I just wore those every day. I had four t-shirts, but like 
So on Friday, which shirt am I going to wear twice this week? And one was like, I lived in Colorado at the time. And one said, I'd rather be in Colorado. And I wasn't quite confident enough to pull it off ironically yet. And so like, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was pretty rough that way. So I ended up getting in a lot of fights, you know, and, but even at one point, like they asked me to join a gang, but I said no, just because I knew that like, I knew what I wanted for my life. And I knew like joining that gang, for example, would put me off of that path. It meant I got in a lot more fights and now I didn't have protection, but I still like had the, the vision for what I wanted in the future. I might not have known exactly. I just knew it was like something more, right? Yeah. So just having having that mindset, is that what really propelled you to the top 25? Because I know at one point you were top 25 you, uh, fighters in the world, right? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, like, like kind of like the mindset I'd use with that is like, I always want, I want to seek out the difficult path. I always want the path to be as hard as possible. Because here's the thing, like, let's say I can deadlift 600 pounds. Like, if the task is deadlift 100 pounds, yeah, that's easy, but also everybody can do it, and you can't tell the difference between me and someone average. So the harder the task gets, the more I separate myself from the task. So I always seek out those. The things. hardest task. Yeah. So instead of running from it, you're right. running towards it. Right. So even the fight we were talking about, Tim Sylvia, like, I was offered two fights. I was offered some guy who's, like, the local hero, and I could have made, like, you know, $2,000 to fight him, and I knew for sure I would have shook hand him. Or they're like, you want to fight Tim Sylvia? He's currently eighth in the world. And we'll pay you X more in sponsors of this. And I'm like, I'll fight that guy. Right? <laughs> like, that guy. Right? Yeah, you know, bring and, it on. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, fortunately, like, I, I knew I'd be a lot faster than him, and I knocked him out in under a minute. Nice. And so, yeah, and so that put me in, you know, 23, 24, depending on who you ask, but top 25. So. So, top 25? Yeah. yeah. Top 25 in the world. Okay. So here you are, top 25 in the world, UFC, kind of at your height, right? On, yeah. on that side of it. And then where did you kind of go from there? I know you that now you've got a huge and successful business. You got a deal with the UFC. You know what I mean? They're selling your dummy. They, they're branding your stuff, right? Mm-hmm. You got a royalty deal or whatever you got worked out there. So how did you go from you know most fighters in general? They're kind of stupid. I'm not yeah, gonna lie, yeah, right? Like most I, fighters I know are them all stupid. The time too. I know, and I know. so you go from like, hey, I'm a fighter, blah blah blah, to now I own these successful businesses. I'm I'm creating my own. So how did you put yourself to that? I mean. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Like you were emancip- emancipated at 16 years old, right? Yeah. And so you, you were living on your own, even from saying you were kind of beat as a child. You had a couple of drug addict parents. So you really even went through a lot to even get to the top 25. Right. And then now you are here at top of your game. How did you transfer that over into business and then start creating your own stuff at that time? Well, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I kind of always said, like, my life kind of ran in parallel. There's, like, Abe the athlete and Abe the businessman, right? And I always did both. Um, while I was a professional fighter, I always had, like, the actual day job. Because as you know, as an executive or you know, as like high level touch manager, that type of stuff. Um, so I always kind of ran them in parallel. So I mean, athletically was like I played uh, football, basketball, track, high school, which let me go play. I had, col- I had college scholarships for um, football and basketball, but I picked football. And then you know, I tried to play in the NFL. And I'm about as good at football as you can be at not playing the NFL. Um, and so then that didn't work, and I started fighting. And then you know, career wise, like I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, graduated with honors and then I got a, you know, a job at this company, that company, and, you know, we'll would, would always trade up. And, but like one of the things I always had in common was like, I maybe only ever do like 10 hours of actual work in a given week, but like they always love me and give me promotions. And it's kind of, at first I can never figure out why. Um, but yeah, so I mean, um, the UFC thing, it was kind of like, you know, after a while I'd screw around at work, like I would play video games or, you know, and then it kind of dawned on me, like, I'm wasting so much of my life. Like, I could learn French or I could do any number of things. So what I decided to do was start my own business. And the first one I tried to start was um, the UFC dummy, just because as a professional fighter, like, I spent so much of my life with grappling dummies that all were just terrible and I hated them. And so, like, I've kind of been in the mindset of, like, what what can I improve? Like, like a fun anecdote is, did you know the flush toilet was patented in, like, the 1850s? But toilet paper wasn't patented until, like, 1930. So like 80 years, there were toilets and no toilet paper. Like, and so like, we like to think all the good ideas are taken, but they're not, they're, they're not. just everywhere. You gotta look for them. And so, um, so I invented a grappling dummy. And, um, you know, I, I originally just wanted the license right off the bat, but no one really saw the vision. So, you know, baby step, baby step. Next thing you know, a year later, I'm in Pakistan, um, setting up my own factory. Um, and then about a year later, I get invited to an event with the UFC. And like the first day, my dummy got caught up in customs. And so like, I didn't even have a product there. And the CEO of the, the manufacturing company for the UFC is just kicking my ass about it. He's like, I don't really get it. I think it's too expensive. And you're probably not that well protected, which is like low-key, I'll steal it if I want to. And I'm just like, and it is what it is. But day two comes, um, this guy comes walking up after a demo. We give him the demo. And um, 
He's like, wow, this is amazing. I'll take twenty thousand. Like twenty thousand dollars worth? That's amazing. He's like, no, I'll take twenty thousand units, which is like eight million dollars worth of units. And it was just like, oh man. And suddenly, like the tune changed for all of that. Or like um, about an hour later. So this is a fun story. I was actually on a Skype call this year with Vladimir Putin. Only for about two <laughs> seconds. Only about two seconds. But it's two seconds longer than you. And, um, <laughs> and so like, so about an hour later, a guy comes up and he asked for a demo. And we get about halfway through his laptop. Vlad needs to see this. And um, he's like, Strauss Mucha, blah, 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 blah. He's like, Vlad, Vlad loves it, you guys. Vlad, meet the guys. And he's like, Vladimir Putin. And like, hey. Yeah. I mean, agree or disagree with politics? Like, <laughs> like, I've been on a Skype call with a world leader this year. Like, that's a pretty cool, like, you know, yeah, like, that's bucket like, list. Check. So, um, yeah, so after that, that was what um, got the UFC's original interest, was just in the lesson got into the world stage. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we helped, um, we went around a bunch of trade shows, and, you know, one thing leads to another. And, and now we're developing like a group exercise, like the same as cardio kickboxing, but with like ground fighting. And so it's been like more than I ever thought it could be. That's awesome. So what I hear a lot, and then we've been talking for a few days, obviously right, working right. together, but what I hear a lot is I hear like, when you talk of failure, when most of us talk of failure, I know you, if you guys are like me, when I talk of failure, it's like, it, it almost becomes me. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I it, it like, it becomes a story that I'm telling myself and it holds me down for a very long mm-hmm. time. But when I talk to you, Failure is just another day for you. It's another second that you just overcome and you just move, right? Something getting held up in customs, that might ruin, like, my whole fucking day or week, and yet you talk about it like it's just another thing. So right. tell me how how you set a mindset like that, how you get to a mindset like that. Well, I'm, I mean, I almost go in expecting to fail, right? Because, like, I'm not so – despite how I might come off, I'm not so arrogant as to think I know everything right about the way. So I'm like, here, I'm going to do the best I can. Better in 50-50 shot, this all blows up in my face, but you know what, I'm going to learn, and I'm going to take that learning, I'm going to go ahead, you know what I mean? And so, so yeah, I mean, I, I just go in expecting to fail, and when I'm successful, then it's like just a nice surprise, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so it's the expectations that you right. go in with yep. of like, hey, failure is not a thing, I know what's coming today, mm-hmm. and I'm just going to embrace it, I'm going right. to get past it. Well, like when I was fighting, it's like, you know, like I don't want to get hit in the face, but I recognize it's super likely that <laughs> right, I'm going to do my best to not get hit. Don't get me wrong. Right, right, I'm right. going to shuck and jive and what, all the things that I can do. But at the end of the day, yes, I'm likely to get punched in the face several times today. And so you just go in knowing that's the situation. You know? So that definitely helped you in your business career, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so tell us a little bit about what you have going on now. I know you've got like multiple businesses. You've got a course like going to be coming out a little bit in a little bit, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, so um, – I mean, so there's like a couple ways to look at it. It's like one, once the UFC deal happened, it was kind of interesting to me how fast my mindset changed from, okay, make money, make money, make money, to, okay, now my grandkids are probably okay. And what do I want to do with the rest of my life? You know, and like what, like Gandhi said, be the change you would see. So what change do I want to see in the world? You know, like one of the things super near and dear to me is like, I grew up super poor and you you learn a lot of how life works by how like you grew up in the environment. So like, but honestly, like poor people act one way and, you know, middle class people another way and upper class another way and then like you know the one percent like they're and they're, they're all playing by way different rules that all have way different like outcomes and consequences and fortunately for me i've lived about one third in each bucket like lower class middle class upper class and so i feel like i have some perspective so i wrote a book about that because like one i want to elevate poor people mm-hmm. um and then another thing i wanted to change was like i hate i think like cubicle farms like you know where you're in cube 37c on floor four <laughs> of this life insurance company's tower like like just cog in the machine just you know i hope i get my three percent raise year over year so i can retire and not have to live in a like a crash home um you know like like i, I look at those people it's like the matrix to me you know what i mean i like so i want to unplug as many people so um for me it's like one like i want to teach people how like if you're working your corporate job or whatever how to spend less time working that corporate job and then two ultimately by the way now that like you know I'm going to teach you how to like work less hours and still get ahead. Just like I've done my whole career. Like, you know, I'm always working 10, 15 hours, just promotion, promotion, promotion. Um, teach people how to like, okay, give you back your time, get you some more money. Okay. You're still getting ahead in your career. But ultimately we all want to be our own boss, right? We're like all anyone can ask for is to be in control of their own lives. Right. And so, um, so now that I've given you back time and now that you have a little bit more money, take that time and money, go start your own business. Gotcha. So your course is going to be relatively around, you know, like, Freeing up your time, one, yeah. making more money with your time, yeah. focus, and then taking that and how can we take back control of our life? Yeah, for um, sure. Because, like, it sounds to me like one of your passions is really getting people out of the box. It's like everybody's living in this box and doing mm-hmm. what they're 
supposed to do, but they're not really living. It. Right. Yeah. Right? I mean, like I got a friend text me. They brought in ice cream on Thursday. I'm like, it's like, congratulations. You live in a gold plated cage, but it is still a cage. It's still a cage. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so yeah, you're dependent on other people right. and yeah. their ability. Um, so being able to overcome that, I think that's yeah. really cool. Or like your, your boss might've gotten an argument with like his wife the night before. So now you don't get a raise because he's in a bad mood. Like who, like, who, who wants any of that, like, to be in control of their lives? You know, all, like, all you can ask for is to be in control of your own life. Right. So tell us some about, about some of your business. It seems like every time and I, I see this about you, and I don't know if you see this about yourself, but it's like I ask you, like, where you get started and stuff. Like, you just got through your roofing company, right? You got your distribution company, like, all this. And it all came from, like, a pain that you, like, seen, and right. then you were able to take that and expand on that. So tell us a little bit. How you're starting these businesses how you're getting like well so like i said i mean it's like the toilet paper and the toilet analogy right like there's all these ideas out there and like i had read this um author i forget his name at the time but he said like very few people are truly world class at anything like but most people are pretty good at a couple things so like find where those couple things intersect and that, that intersection you're the best in the world so like for the dummy for example it's like i'm a reasonably competent mma fighter right i'm but i'm never like i never won a world championship and never will but i'm like pretty good and um, I have a degree in engineering, graduate with honors, but it's not like I'm a rocket scientist. I don't work at NASA and never will. But engineers who understand manufacturing and design who also know how to fight, like, I'm the best in the world at that. Like, and, or, and so, like, with a roofing company, like, my dad was a roofer growing up. Oh, okay. Which is also, you know, part of why we were poor and, and whatnot. Because um, <laughs> like, the actual person pounding the actual nails doesn't actually doesn't do that make a lot. Money. Right. Um, And so um, – I'd done that over the summer, so I was vaguely familiar with it. And then, like, my house got hit by hail, and they gave me a $17,000 check for it to get a new roof and gutters. I talked to my um, boxing coach, who is, um, you know, big blue Mexican, and, like, <laughs> a great boxing coach. So I talked to Jose, and Jose um, gives me a reference. Next thing you know, I have six guys on my roof. We're paying three grand. We spent three grand at Menards, and I keep 10000 I'm like, wow, I didn't know there's, I didn't know that was a thing you could do. And so I'm like, I should start my own roofing company. And so I did. And so, so first year, half million dollar yeah. <laughs> game over, it just keeps growing. Yep, exactly. And so like, that seems like that's a big thing for me. Uh, and I'm sure it is for you guys as well. Um, it's like, when, like opportunity, knowing when to grab it, knowing when to run with it, knowing when to, to put your time and effort and focus behind it, I think is a big thing. I think that you do that really well, right? You, you're able to separate the bullshit and not know, hey, this isn't worth my time to this right. is worth my time. Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you just as many stories about businesses I tried to start that failed, right? Like, yeah. I can tell you how I bought a gun repair shop, owned it for a month, and decided I was spending way more time and not making much money, and so I sold it back. I mean, I flipped it for, like, I made 10 grand on the sale. But, like, yeah, so I tried to unsuccessfully to run a gun repair shop. Um, I'm really into barbecue, so I made my own smoker out of, like, a 55-gallon drum. And so there was a year where I made probably 20, 55 gallon drum smokers for people, but I was only making like 200 bucks a smoker and I spent like five hours on it. Like, <laughs> like this is, so yeah, I tried to start an eight build smokers business. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, I have so many failures that are just like comical. But that's the thing too, is you don't want to be that guy that's like strung out on his last dollar on Shark Tank and like his like in-laws have loaned him a hundred thousand. This guy, like, like if a hundred people, like if a hundred people say it's a bad idea, odds are it's a bad idea. At some point, you know, like, I'm not saying quit dreaming, just find a new dream, right? Like, right. it's my dream originally to be an NFL football player. Didn't quite work out. It was my dream to be, like, you know, world champion, MMA fighter. Close, but, again, didn't quite work out. And so, like, that's why I'm not 39 years old right now, still trying out for NFL teams. I'm like, okay, like, this this is I, – I pursued this as hard as I could, which we all should. But at the end of the day, this isn't it. So I didn't just, like, give up on life either. I'm not still talking about how great a football player I am, you know, 15 years later. I, 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 I'm on like my fourth dream since then, you know what I mean? So it's just like find a new dream when you realize it's not working and then, you know, go on with that too. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, if you guys have questions, go ahead and post them for Abe. I'll read them to him at some point. If you guys have questions, you can post them on there. Uh, but we're just going to keep talking about business. We're going to keep talking about him, his experience. And I think a big thing that I want you to talk about is really like you've been where most people are right now. And mm -hmm. like, what do you see – as an obstacle, or what do you see that they need to do to be able to get out of their own way and move forward? What What is it that you see that most people are failing at that's stopping them from progressing forward in life? Well, well, for me, like, I think what we were talking earlier, you know, it's like, I always felt like I had a ton of drive, and again, I always had this just, like, vague sense of I want more, but I wasn't, you know, just quite sure what that meant. And again, I would put in effort, like, like I was telling you, like, I wanted a new job, so I'd come home and I'd fill out 30 generic applications in an hour, and then the next night, the next night, by the end of the week, I'd filled out like 100 applications, 
and none of them mattered because I spent like two minutes time on it, you know, I'm just spinning my wheels. But like the dangerous thing there is it makes you feel like you're being productive, even though you're not. And so like, just as a side note, I'll answer your question, but as a side note, like I'm super vigilant against stuff that makes me feel like I'm doing stuff, but I'm really not, you know what I mean? Like whether you're looking over someone's shoulder and like making sure they're doing it, like you're not being productive, you know? Um, and so I'm always hyper aware of how I'm spending my time that way. But I think fundamentally it's like, you need to have like a plan of action. You need to have a goal. And once you settle on that goal, then from there, like whatever you do either takes you to that goal or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't really have a place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So focus, you'd say yeah. focus is a big thing. Um, how about like fear? I see a lot of people that, that they get stuck in fear, right? Yeah. And so they have like these great fucking ideas. I talk to a lot of people and I'm like, dude, that's brilliant. I don't want to take it from you, but I'm going to, if you don't move forward right, right. like fast, yeah, no, um, I mean, and they, they never get anywhere with it. And so um, what do you know about fear and overcoming fear? And, and, and I mean, that it's all of this is scary, right? I mean, it's like one thing when you're playing with someone else's money. It's another thing when you're playing with your money. It's another thing when you're trading on someone else's name. And then when it's your name. I mean, I, I will tell you this, that I had 20 professional fights and I threw up before every single one of them. Like just like emptied everything that was in my body. I threw up just because I'm so nervous and so afraid. And then you get in there and I, I like the, the analogy I always give for fighting is like, um, if you ever rolled a roller coaster, you know, you stand in line for like three hours. So in fighting, you train for like three months and then you're going up the hill. And as you get up, get up the, to the top of the hill, there's like this second where you're like, this is a terrible idea. I don't, I don't want to be on this roller coaster, but you're buckled in and there's really no way off. And so, you know, like when they call your name, you're walking out to the cage, you're like, shit, you know, like, I'm like, I have a good job. I don't want to be locked in the cages. <laughs> you know, like, like I, just, I just don't want to do this. But like, now my mom is here and I don't want to look like a bitch in front of her. And like, you know, it's just you know, all this, all this stuff. And so, I mean, like, and again, like, so for fighting, like most people's nightmare is them in their underwear in front of a crowd. And that's like step one of MMA, get in your underwear, get in front of 5,000 people. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, so then, you know, like back to the roller coaster analogy, but then once you're in your roller coaster and you're just like enjoying the ride. And then as soon as you pull back into the station, you're like, I can't keep back in there. And so that was kind of the thing. Like if you can get to the point where you're just enjoying the ride, um, the fear all goes away. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and then it's, and that's when it's fun. So you got to like, it's like, are you sure you want to do this? Well, I never want to do it right before I'm going to do it, but yeah, I'm going to do it, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so just accept that that's part of the process. The same as failure is part of the process, being afraid of shit, but also still going to do it, you know? Yeah. So you'd say fear, fear never goes away. No, I, I'm, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's still like, I, if I'm a hundred percent honest, there's still times I wake up and I'm like, I just, I wish I had a nine to five and didn't have anything to think about. And I would just go be like, you know, regular like existence. But um, honestly, that's just not what I'm built for. Like I get bored when, when um, everything is consuming anyway. So. Right. And once you start opening up your mind to where you kind of open your mind, it's hard to go back. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's like, we were talking about this the other day. It's called un like we're unemployable yeah. for our own reasons. You yeah. know what I mean? Like once you're educated to mm -hmm. a certain point, it's like, I can never work for that. Right. Right. And well, just, and I mean, like, in, in here, like, I mean, this this one's not so much in careers because this will drive everybody from, from their day job, like, tomorrow. But it's like, anytime you put in any effort to anything, you create value. Like, if you fry an egg, that egg is worth more than before you fried it because it took some time and applied to you, and now it's more eatable. Um, so anytime you put in effort, you create value. There's two numbers. There's the value you create, which is what anyone's willing to pay for it. Right. And there's the value you actually capture, which is what you get paid for it. It's like, I hate mowing the lawn, so I pay a company $50 a week to mow my lawn, right? So that guy that came and mowed my lawn, he created $50 of value because that's what I would pay to have my grass short. Um, but he probably got paid $10, right? And so it's like, dude, you're capturing 20% of the value you put out in a given day. Like, that's not, that's not a sustainable thing to do. Like, but meanwhile, his boss, he captures 50% of him and he has six of him, which is 300%. And he lives in a million dollar house, even though he owns a lawn care business. You know what I mean? And so like, once you know that math, once you know the captured versus like actual, it's so hard to be on, on the on the low end of that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, I can't bring myself to do it at this point, honestly. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so what, what would be some of the biggest advice you'd have for these guys to really like get out of their own way? Like we talked a little bit about that, but like, what do you see? Like, here, here's the thing that I think holds up a lot of people, like including myself, motivation, like getting up in the morning and doing what's needed, creating those habits to get us to that next step in life, right? Um, and, and being able to do them day in and day out, because there's a lot of times in life that 
I get in and I'll put in a day or two and then I'm just like, fuck, I want to lay on the couch. I want to watch fucking Vikings today or I want to go and do this or I want to go, right? Yeah. Like there's, there's times well, Vikings that I just is good. Vikings is good. No, Meredith is good. <laughs> but either way, like you get stuck and then you never get back to what you have to do. You can't successfully create those habits. So um, in ending, like what would you tell them? What What's the biggest thing for them to stay motivated, keep motivated, keep moving forward, keep pushing what, what are some of the things that you've trained your brain over the years? Because that's one thing that you do. Dude, you're always going. Like, mm-hmm. you're here. Last week, you were in freaking Tennessee, right? Yeah. Talked about that. And apparently, you went out there. You, like, right. you told me about a trip that you went around. It's like, you're always moving. You're always doing something. Mm-hmm. And that comes back to that focus. But it also comes back to having the motivation to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. So how have you trained your brain on the way out if you could tell these? Well, I mean, like, if, from a psychology standpoint, for someone to do anything, it takes three things. They have to have the ability, they have to have the motivation, and then they have to have a trigger. And honestly, if you feel like you don't have enough motivation, even that you notice you don't have, you probably have enough motivation just because you notice. What you're probably missing is the trigger. And so I think, like, if I have to consciously make the decision to go to the gym, or if I have to consciously go to the, make the decision to, like, go work on a business, like, like, yeah, I'll do it some of the time, but, like, it's still a decision, which implies, like, yes or no, right? And so I just try to set up like routines, right? Like, like I know that if my ass touches the sofa at 5 p.m., I'm not leaving the house. So I go to the gym before I get home because I know I won't go after I stop home. Um, so I try to just put everything on autopilot as far as like taking the decision points out of the day. It's like I know for a fact I want to write for an hour. So no matter what, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., I'm writing. And so like, oh, it's 10 a.m., time to write. It's not like, well, do I really feel like writing? I mean, oh, maybe I could just do the, like, so I, I, I try to personally take out the decision points and attach as many triggers. Like, like I, I would never floss because it just doesn't occur to me to do, like I'm sure like most people. And so like to decide to floss is hard, but if I just make it, I brush my teeth and I floss, I brush my teeth and I floss, I brush my teeth and I floss. Like 10 days later, I'm not thinking about flossing. I'm just flossing because that's what I do after I brush my teeth, right? You know, like there's so many things like that. So I just try to tie, tie actions that I'm going to do anyway to actions that I want to do until it becomes second nature. And then I just take, take all the decision points out of the day because I made those decisions in advance and then my day just flows. Perfect. Well, there you guys have it. Um, we're going to jump off of here. Bam fam. I'm going to be putting him in the bam fam group. So you guys can ask him questions and that kind of stuff for the rest of you. We're going to get out of here. We'll talk to you guys later. Have a good one. Thanks guys. Peace.